We're on this beautiful but extremely wild part of the Welsh coast to tackle a baffling archaeological mystery. We're going to try and uncover secrets which have remained hidden since the Dark Ages and beyond. There's only one problem. Our site is over there on that island. It's called Gatehome and it's got to be one of the most dangerous and inaccessible places we've ever excavated. That is stunning. Oh, yes. It's lovely, isn't it? Well, my heart's definitely beating faster. All in the name of archaeology. I'm actually quite excited about this. That is fantastic. Incredibly, Gatehome seems to have been inhabited. Although, whether it was by Celts or Vikings or Druids, no one knows. Who would want to set up home over there? To get over there, we've got to use this zip wire. It could be the toughest time team we've ever attempted. Tell my wife I love her. OK, we're going to go now. Will the archaeology be worth risking my life for? Well, I hope so. OK, when you're ready, Tony, leap off and then turn and face me. Leap? Oh, God. Well, I'm still alive, but something tells me the original islanders must have had another way of getting home. Well done. Thank you. Well, it wasn't, wasn't quite as scary as I thought it was going to be, but... Having said that, <laughs> see that? Ah, uh, it was quite an experience. Gate home's so difficult to access, we've had to send in an advanced team of climbers to set up a 300 metre long zip wire. Every archaeologist and every piece of kit will have to cross on this single line. It's a slow and hazardous process. Excavating this precipitous and exposed rock will be a serious challenge. Francis, you've yes. already started digging. Well, Tony, I can't wait for you all day. I mean, it's now, well, gone noon. Yeah, on day one. On day one. And you've dug that much. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. <laughs> uh, our schedule is completely shot, isn't it? It's taking forever to get everybody over. Well, the thing is, Tony, I mean, there's an awful lot of archaeology here. We've just got to get going. I'm getting a tiny bit panicky about it. Gate Home and its surroundings are owned and managed by the National Trust. Though there's not a stately home in sight on this rugged stretch of coastline, the Trust have invited us here to the far west of Wales to help unlock Gate Home's secrets. <laughs> We've surveyed the island from land and air. Geophysicist Emma and new member of the team, landscape archaeologist Alex Langlands, are examining the results. This is showing the, uh, the wider landscape of the area. And I've, I've got the LIDAR, which is the radar that's been taken from the plane. It shoots points right. to the ground, so we can actually see a 3D map. That is bringing out some bits and pieces, isn't it? And I've actually got the aerial photograph, and when I drape that over, you can actually see the structures. That is brilliant. Certainly from this, they're not just lumps and bumps. Th these are actually rectangular yeah. buildings, aren't they? I mean, one of the things that this does bring out is that this island is absolutely peppered, isn't it? Yeah. With structures. Mm. And if they're all of the same period, this would have been a really quite a busy place. So at some point in history, human activity left traces all over this small rock. One theory is that Gatehome could be a forgotten sacred isle, an ancient place of pagan worship, and even that it could be the site of an early Christian monastery. Could this have been a ritual site? I think that's fairly likely, Tony. Yes, I do. Um, but I suspect, like a lot of religious sites, it was actually placed on a bit of landscape that had been sort of important, magical, if you like, for a very long time. 
So not only have we got a mysterious and perhaps sacred isle, but on the mainland, a mere quarter of a mile away, is another significant monument. With curved earth banks and ditches on one side and a sheer cliff on the other, it looks like a classic Iron Age promontory fort. As if our job wasn't tough enough already, we're going to excavate here as well. To help Francis site his trenches, John and his geophysics team are busy surveying the fort's interior. While waiting for the geophys results to come in, Phil organises a field walking team to scour the area around the fort with unexpected results. Oh, what? Oh, <laughs> what? Oh, what? That is stunning. You stick that in the end of, a, of an arrow shaft yep. or something like that, and you have got a very, very lethal, absolutely lethal projectile point. If ever we needed to be proven that we're into the Mesolithic. Yep. This is it. It's also vital evidence, proof that this site could have first been inhabited up to 10,000 years ago, far earlier than we thought. Over on the island of Gateholm, Francis is using aerial mapping to position his trenches. You've got this trench that Alex is in, you've got this little one that Matt's in, and then the far one where Ian is, but they do look like three tiny, rather arbitrary trenches a third of the way across the uh, island. Ah, oh, they're not arbitrary, Tony. I never do anything that's arbitrary. If you look, they're in a straight line. Yes. Right? They're in a straight line across what I think might be a road. You've got this, you can see this from the air, and I've put the trenches in a line across the road like that. Now, why do you think that that is a road? Well, these little boxes are, I think, rooms of houses or monk cells or something like that. And then they're on either side of a space, which I think is a roadway. Where do you go next? Um, the next target, I think, is going to be this roundhouse here. Um, we'll put a trench in that. That's important because I'm pretty sure that's going to be Iron Age. If we can find evidence of Iron Age settlement both here on the island and on the mainland fort, we may establish a link between the two sites. Two earlier digs on the island in 1910 and 1930 didn't come up with any convincing conclusions, but there were some great finds. Our other new team member, Mariana Hotter, is examining the evidence. There's some really remarkable objects here. Alan, tell me more about this one. It's a bronze pin. It's probably a cloak pin, almost certainly Irish. All the best parallels are from Ireland, a small number from Scotland. And they belong within the, that general post-Roman pre-Viking period, so possibly from the 5th, maybe as late as the 8th century. That's not the only incredible artefact, is it? Look at this. This is absolutely fantastic, isn't it? It's a really beautiful bronze stag that was discovered on the island. What's the significance of the stag shape? Well, it's really interesting. We don't know for certain, but it could represent hunting, but it may well also have some kind of ritual significance as well, some religious significance. So ritual significance, that ties in with this quite extraordinary stone phallus. This was discovered in one of the huts when they were excavating, and it was actually placed upright symbolising either fertility or it's there for good luck. We know that the Romans quite often used folly um, to, to bring them good luck. So this range of artefacts, it's quite incredible, isn't it? We've got the phallus, the pin, the stag, all coming from this very small area. There's some reason why people are returning to this site here. Based on these finds, we can tell that the island was occupied from the mid to late Roman period, 200 to 410 AD, into the very early Christian times of the 5th and 6th centuries. But we may also find signs of earlier or later occupation. I mean, it's not very strong. With the Geophys survey on the mainland fort completed... Phil to France is. Phil's impatient to get digging. Yes, Phil? We've got a Geophysics part over here. We want you to come over and authorise us to put the trenches in. I'll be over there in a couple of ticks. OK. That's all I want now, a couple of ticks. While our site director heads back to the mainland, the island team keep digging. And Rakshar thinks she may have hit the jackpot. How are the finds going? Have you, uh... Do you know what? It's been brilliant, absolutely brilliant. If you uh, open out your, your hand and... Yeah. 
check it out. It's all wow. the same port. Right. That is fantastic. I'm actually quite excited about this because we dug a site in Cornwall and we were finding pottery that looked very similar to this. Right. And that site was a bit of a centre for imports and that pottery was dating to post-Roman period and, and some of it was coming as far away as Byzantium. Right. So I'm really excited. I'm really hoping that is that. That is fantastic, actually. <laughs> Rakshar's pottery will help us date the island's settlements, while earlier finds like the stag and the phallus are clues to what went on here. We think Gateholm may have been a ritual site in Roman and even prehistoric times. So on the mainland, Mary Ann is recreating the context in which the phallus was found. And it was just rammed in It was just earth. rammed in upright into the earth. It's not easy, is it? No, it isn't. Then you pack up the earth around it to make sure it stays upright. What's the significance of a little shrine like this? Well, the thallus clearly is it's a fertility symbol. There it is rammed into the earth. You can't get more symbolic than that, can you, with the sort of Mother Earth and the, the phallus and, and everything arising from that. So it's actually quite a splendid thing. It is, it certainly is. And I think that the phallus here is possibly mirroring the whole shape of the island. I think the whole shape could have been an enormous phallic symbol of prosperity and fertility. Leaving behind our penile island for the moment, Francis arrives at the mainland fort. About time too. Where have you been? Where he's hoping John's geophys results will give us some good targets. We've surveyed the plateau. Yeah. And to be honest, the results are a bit confusing. I mean, what would you expect in that area? Well, behind the ramparts, I'd expect evidence for settlement, pits, houses, that sort of thing. It's more interesting. Are these Could this series of indistinct blobs really be signs so of a domestic settlement? Me, I'd say let's put a trench across that possible settlement mm -hmm. response and a trench across one of these possible pits. Yes, no, I agree. I think the possible pits are very important for no other reason that they're near the entrance. Mm, yeah. So, I mean, they, I think they will date the site. Francis approves the position of the first two trenches, one just inside the entrance and the other at the centre of our Iron Age promontory fort. But Phil's made an important find and now thinks the site could have far earlier origins. I've been doing a bit of field walking with one or two of them over there and I can prove that people were living up here before the Iron Age. We've actually got some finds. Look what we got there. That is a pebble hammer. They're a bit dodgy to date, but there have been some that have turned up on Mesolithic sites. So we've, we've got occupation here at least, let's say, 8,000 years. So let's not just assume that everything that John mm. sees there is Iron Age. This is very exciting, Phil. Right? This is it's stunning. I know, it's going back in my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's get cracking on these two trenches. trenches then. Two trenches, yes. Yep. You can go away again. Yeah. Oh, no, no. thank you very much. Oh, we don't off. need you yeah. anymore. Yeah. <laughs> With the trench strategy approved, Phil calls in the heavy mob to start digging on the mainland fort. Are down there. Over on the island, Alex has been looking for clues as to how the original islanders got on and off their rock. If you look over here, you'll see that we've got this stack. And I have done a little bit of research and pulled out... This is an illustration. It's a rather crude copy, though, of a sketch made in 1839. Well, what they've done is they've depicted... See the stack there? Yeah. See it here? <clears throat> OK, look at the height of that stack. It's higher than where we are now, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, exactly. OK, and of course, today, it's much lower down, so we've lost a lot of material there. But also, importantly, there was a land bridge connecting the stack, OK, to the island that we're on now. So I'm pretty sure that there's a good chance, a 1,000 years ago, that if you'd had enough of this place, you could simply wander back to the mainland without having to think about tides and zip wires. As day one draws to a close, the island team are heading for home and safety. You know, one thing I had factored in was that it takes as long to get back as it does 
to go there. So we're actually losing time at the end of the day as well, aren't we? We are, Tony, but I'm actually very keen to see what Rakshar's got with her. I know, she's got a really <laughs> large red bag there. I can't <laughs> believe that's completely full of fines. That's the scary bit, isn't it? Oh <laughs> Don't damage the fines! <laughs> oh. Hang on, I'll get Danny over. Danny! No. Danny, Danny, Danny. Hello. <coughs> Have a look at this stuff. Oh, wow, this is exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about it. <laughs> this is like Christmas, isn't it? <laughs> I'm really, really excited about this. Yeah. Mainly because I think it might be imported. Oh, yeah. It's certainly not prehistoric, is it? No, no it's not prehistoric. It's not, is, is it? it? No, no, no. Not, not that colour. No. No. <laughs> well, that is a really nice bright orange colour, isn't it? So yeah. it's definitely not prehistoric. Nope. Um, and at first glance, I mean, it'd be nice to get this cleaned up and washed, but it does look like it's Roman. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. This morning, we thought we had an early Christian settlement, but now it looks increasingly likely to be Romano-British. So we've had some fantastic finds today over there on the fort, and we've had some great finds that have really made Raksha's day over there on the island. The question is, are the two sites linked? Hopefully, we'll find out tomorrow. <laughs> Beginning of day two here in this gorgeous part of Pembrokeshire and we're trying to work out why for thousands of years people have inhabited this spectacular cliff top and the highly inaccessible island of Gatehome over there. Francis, you look like you're surveying the scene. What's the strategy for today? Um, well, the strategy for today is to go pretty hard because we're very worried about rain coming. So I'm going to extend that trench over there by the entranceway where we've got a sort of cobbled surface, which I think could be roadway, but it could be covering pits. Then I want to come over to this trench, extend that, where I think there might be foundations of roundhouses. So uh, that could be an Iron Age settlement, then? Uh, it could be, Tony. His fingers are very crossed. Yeah. yeah. And then over there, where this natural cliff path goes through the bank surrounding this hill fort, there's a, they've already, you know, people's feet have started to cut a trench, so we're simply going to continue the process. So do you think that bank is some kind of wall? Yes, I think it may well be. It certainly continues up here. Now, this is a very substantial bank, rampart, a wall, and then there's another one there and another beyond, and then signs of another one beyond that. We're getting really stuck in at the fort. We're sure it's Iron Age, as much as 700 years or so before the Romans arrived and signs of domestic life are now beginning to emerge. What have you got here? That looks amazing. I think <laughs> floor is about all you can say at the moment. I have a to... potential floor. Well, I wasn't expecting to see anything quite that good, actually, to be honest with you, in here. We've already exposed this much so far, but it definitely runs up to this stone and in that direction. That's beautiful. The fort's inhabitants built high banks to protect them from attack. But how effective were these defences in the event of an all-out assault? We've waxed fairly lyrical about these amazing defences, but we haven't really said anything at all about who or what the people inside would have been defending themselves against. Well, uh, probably we went raiding tribes, and we think that raiding was fairly endemic. Rather than trying to take territory, it was probably more raiding. So it's um, not only cattle that they're probably trying to take, but also slaves by the time of the Roman period. But the layout of the defences themselves are so crucial. I mean, we've got the outer bank there, and you can see it's, it's actually bending round, and this, this bank that we're on now is also bending round. The whole idea is to funnel people in, isn't it? Yeah, really, they're trying to channel people down one single route into a killing zone. OK, so you've got all these invaders charging towards us. Yep. What exactly do we do? Well, we get out our slings, we get a load of pebbles, and this is what we use at range. And when they can get closer, you can just use bigger guns you... and just hurl, hurl rocks at them. Do you want an attack in force? That would be great. Come on, then. So are we going to use stones now? Uh, no, I think we'll just go for uh, a, a softer option. We come back here and launch... What I like so much about this demonstration is that we've got two innocent archaeologists in the foreground who are quite likely to receive collateral damage. <laughs> but I guess that's just war, isn't it? Right, come on then, attack us! Right, charge! Hey! Whoa, yeah. no! 
Not bad. Not yeah. bad. <laughs> Found it much more difficult to. Oh, got him! And we got people chucking oh. rocks as well. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is a battle we might just be losing. <laughs> it's all right. We we don't want your cattle. We don't want your horse. <laughs> <laughs> Before I fall victim to further tribal assaults, I'm making a break for the island on the dreaded zip wire. Ooh. It kind of doesn't feel quite so bad the second time, but then you get a bit overconfident and, uh, uh, and look down. <laughs> Oh, I'm glad that harness is released from in there now. I can't <laughs> quite walk properly. <laughs> We've got a unique opportunity to unlock the secrets of this highly inaccessible, truly mysterious island. But if we're to solve the riddle in the short time we've got left, every trench has to count. Your trench has cleaned up really nicely. I know, I'm quite glad it rained last night. <laughs> I could actually see something for once. And what can you see? I've actually got a wall line here. Where's the wall line? Is it... Have you got one sort of across there like that yeah. and then the other one's obviously there? Yep, that's right. But do you remember last night when I bought you all that pottery? Yeah. Well, I'm actually standing inside the building and this is where the pottery came from. Well, that's strange though, isn't it? Because... If this is Roman, that doesn't really square with what Francis was saying yesterday. When he looked at the air pictures, he thought that this would probably be early Christian, a, a monastery or something. But it, it still can be early Christian, though. What I'm wondering is whether they're actually imports, so they could have been traded into this island. But if that's the case, it would be very early Christian, wouldn't it? Which would be really exciting. Well, exactly. What about in Ian Strange? Well, Ian has the other side of the road, and it's over one of those other cell buildings. But it's a bit weird, cos all the finds he's getting are prehistoric. They can't have stayed here that long, can oh, Well, they? exactly, and it's, like, only, what, four metres away? Yeah. It's really weird. You know, often, by this stage on Time Team, I'm getting really nervous because there are so many unresolved issues. But on this island, I kind of like the fact that it's so mysterious. I know. What's going on? It seems that generation upon generation set up home on this exposed, rocky outcrop. What drew them here? And was there once a link between the people living here and the community at the mainland fort? Maybe Matt's trench can give us at least one of the answers. We're on the edge of this roundhouse here. Oh, so this is Iron Age? Well, that's the idea, yes. We've got a small wall in front of me here, and if you look very carefully, you can see it coming round just behind me there. It's quite small, only about four or five metres across. And on the inside, we've got what looks like a clay floor coming here. Any finds? Yes, just a few minutes ago, this great find came up there. That's now, it's either a spindle whirl or I think that actually it might be a bead. If you hold it up to the light, you can see it's, it's like amber or something. The light shines through it. Oh, it's lovely, isn't it? Look at the other. Oh, there's some little marks on it here. Yeah, these little black marks. I'm not quite sure if they're a pattern on it. Or just a bit of fungus. It's mm. hard to know. If the bead turns out to be of amber, it'll be an important find. Amber's a high-status material, so the bead, like the phallus and the stag, could be evidence of ritual practice. This island seems to get ever more mysterious, but there's still no sign of the monastic site earlier archaeologists thought might be here. Halfway through day two, and there's still a lot of work to do. We're off the Pembrokeshire coast on the very mysterious island of Gatehome. And not the least of the mysteries is the fact that we appear to have some kind of street here. We've got a trench open on either side. On the western side, there appears to be some sort of cell where Rakshars found Roman pottery. But on the eastern side, there's another small room where we've got prehistoric finds. What's even doubly curious is the fact that, according to earlier archaeologists, this was neither Roman nor prehistoric, but part of some early Christian monastic site. So what on earth's going on, do you think, Francis? It's a bit confusing, Penny, but I think, I think we're about to crack it. We are in another little room here, but we have a ditch. Now, this ditch that Ian is working in is absolutely fascinating. 
because I think it's probably Bronze or Iron Age, and it goes with the material that we were finding here yesterday. Okay. Now, what's interesting about this ditch is that it's been filled in with large quantities of rock, deliberately filled in. Now, why do you fill in a feature like that? You don't do that if you're a farmer building, you know, a, a barn or something. This goes with something like either a Roman settlement or a monastic settlement where the land has to be prepared before other structures can be erected. So, an early big ditch with a monastery on top of it, could it still be a sacred isle? Yes, I think it could, Tony. I'd like to find some early Christian material to be sure of its date, but it's not impossible yet, you know. So, we still could have a monastic settlement. The settlement could still prove to be early Christian, so 5th to 7th century, but it seems more likely to be mid-Roman, 2nd to 3rd century. Civilizations have come and gone, but since the dawn of time, this exposed spot has endured the brunt of the weather coming in off the Irish Sea. Despite today's threatening skies, we're working flat out. At the entrance to the fort, we've dug down half a metre, but there's still no sign of a pit. Excavating the defences in the outer trench, we're looking for finds to help date the site. And in the centre of the fort is emerging more of what we believe to be the floor of an Iron Age roundhouse. Even in summer, this coast can be a hostile environment. One reason why our ancestors set up home here may have been the abundant supply of wild food available to supplement their diet. Andrew, on a day like today, it's not the most fun thing to go foraging for food, but let's be honest, that's what the ancestors had to do. They couldn't sit inside when it was raining. No, that's true enough, but you don't come to Wales for good weather. <laughs> and, um, yeah, you're right, they, back in the Iron Age, you couldn't have just sat around watching TV because there wasn't any TV. And, of course, you'd have had to be out looking for food constantly, maintaining the defences and, you know, just doing things to stay alive, really. mary -Ann and Andrew are foraging for our supper. I've got this one, it's silverweed. It's called silverweed because of the colour of the underside of the leaf there. You can eat the leaves, they're not particularly exciting, but the useful part, particularly from a sort of survival point of view, is the roots. It's a good starch source, so it's um, carbohydrates. Oh, it's like French fries. Oh, really? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> this sort of foreshore landscape, this is where you get limpets, mussels, cockles. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Oh, look at they're, that. They're a type of snail, basically, and then when the tide comes in, they all kind of creep around, suctioning themselves to the rock, sucking all the algae off the rock. So they're not bivalves, but they're not as, as risky an endeavour to, to eat as things like... Um, mussels and oysters and that sort of thing, which can concentrate toxins from the water. So these are a really safe, really good food source. Oh, look at that, that looks fantastic. <laughs> Combining foraged plants, limpets and seaweed with a leg of local lamb, mary -Ann and Andrew are cooking an Iron Age meal for us. Certainly nutritious, but our reserve judgment okay. on how it tastes. Up on the cliffs, it's time to check in on progress at the fort. Phil? Ten o'clock I was here last, and now it's almost the end of the day. How have you got on? Really, really well, Tony. I mean, we got three trenches open, and they're really, really interesting trenches. And funnily enough, they're actually all telling us something about different important aspects of life on the promontory fort. What do you mean by that? Well, this is our first trench, yeah. and this trench reflects the entrance, you've literally just come through it. Yeah. They've put down a lot of hard standing, and so as people come through, they disperse across this hard standing into the main part of the fort. OK, so that's trench one. The second aspect of the fort, which is obviously crucially important, are the actual people that lived here. Yeah. So here we're actually looking for their houses. That's uh, this trench over here? Absolutely. What have you got? Well... 
The first thing is this feature here. This cropped up when the trench was a lot smaller, so we've opened it up. Now, we don't really know what it is, but there are some people that like to think that it might be a hearth. If it is a hearth, it's going to be in the central part of a roundhouse. So what we've done is extended the trench far enough in that direction so that if there's a wall there, we should be able to find it, and that would then confirm that we are actually dealing with a roundhouse. OK, that's trench two. What about trench three? Well, trench three is all about the other important part of life in the hill fort, and that is the defences themselves. And what we've got here is a section through the bank of the ramparts. And you can actually see that right at the front end there, we've got some really, really big stones actually strengthening the front of the bank. And what we want to do is get through that, see whether we can see any finds underneath the bank that might tell us when this bank was put up. Does that mean you haven't got any finds at all yet? We've got a few scraps of flint which probably relate to the Mesolithic people that were living here. We've had no bone, but that's not really surprising. The soil is so acidic, the bone wouldn't survive. Also, interestingly, it had no pottery. Now, the Iron Age people would probably have had no pots at all. So the sheer fact that we've had neither pot nor bone is significant. Tell me, what sort of pottery have you had on the island? Roman. Exactly. The Romans were on the island, but the Romans were not here. The people that were here were undoubtedly the people that were living here before the Romans came. While most of the team head for the pub, a few of us are under orders from Mary Ann to attend her Iron Age picnic. Your food smells good. <laughs> what have you got <laughs> for us? We were going to eat it before you got here. Doesn't seem like too much of a hardship at first. We've been uh, doing a bit of foraging <laughs> yeah. in the local area. We've got sandfire, seaweed, some lovely limpets, a little starter. Ooh, yeah. A, a little star, and that is a it little star. Is, is this all I'm going to get? Mmm. Delicious. I tell you what, this samphire, I love samphire, but it doesn't look like the stuff that I've eaten before. No, it's a different species from the marsh samphire, so it's much more aromatic, quite crunchy. Tastes good, though. Oh, it's nice, that. Have a nibble. You just eat it? Yeah. Yeah. It's a bit peppery, isn't it? I feel... It's one of your five a day, Phil. Oh, God, he's got that face again. <laughs> moan, moan, moan. But it's the same face I've always had. But... <laughs> and this is my portion, a isn't lovely it, this bit one? Of lamb. It certainly smells good. We're all exhausted. The rain <laughs> is going so hard, my soup splashing all over my face. <laughs> all we've got to eat is limpets and seaweed. Will we make it through tomorrow? I hope so. I don't oh, believe it! <laughs> Could somebody invent a house? <laughs> <laughs> Beginning of day three here in Pembrokeshire, and it looks as though over on the island, amongst all the mysteries, we've got an Iron Age roundhouse, although we haven't quite proved it yet. Looks as though we might have another one over here too, where Phil's been digging, although, again, although that's Phil's instinct, we haven't been able to confirm it. But if, during the course of the day, we can prove that we've got two Iron Age roundhouses, then we'll be well on the way to establishing a link between what was happening over there in the Iron Age and what was was happening over here. Meanwhile, in this Promontory Fort site, things have been getting more and more interesting. It looks as though we've got some really sophisticated defences, and all this is part of them, isn't it, Francis? Yes, it is, Tony. We're right in the heart of the defences here. We've got the main ditch coming through. We've got at least three sets of ramparts. And what I'm interested in here is, is there a path leading to the main entrance coming along this outer bank here. What, so this walkway would link up with that enormous bit of hard standing that Phil excavated yesterday? Yes, I think hard standing means roadway, I think, in that case. And what I'm hoping is when we get to the bottom of this bank, we'll come across more of that road. It would be great, wouldn't it, if we could get a sort of 100-yard snake of road leading right through into where the habitations are. It would be fantastic, absolutely fantastic. But the thing is, Tony, you've got to realise that these defences aren't just about sort of military operations, they're about impressing people coming in to visit whoever was living in there. It completely overturns all my prejudices about what might have been going on in Wales during the Iron Age. I'd thought there would just be a handful of people sitting on the cliff eating winkles and limpets. This, Tony, is no backwater. 
It seems Francis is right. On the final day of this dig, a picture of a well-planned settlement is beginning to emerge. Not only do we have evidence of a large stone-floored building, but excavations on the outer bank reveal that it once followed the cliff edge, encircling the entire fort. A good idea. No one wants to take a tumble into the sea on a dark night. Whether as a source of food or for trade with distant lands, the sea played an integral part in the lives of these coastal peoples. Alex and Miranda are heading to the sheltered inlet of Martin's Haven to investigate further. Some pretty windy, twisty lanes there, Miranda. Yeah, yeah, here we are, this perfect natural harbour, and you'd get around by sea. You wouldn't bother with the lanes, you would just use a boat, and it'd be so much faster, wouldn't it? Much faster and much easier. And of course, we we're only a stone's throw from our fort as well, so it's highly likely that a bay like this would have yeah. been used by the people that lived there. Well, the fort and a gate home, I think. Right. Yeah, definitely. Well, it just so happens we've got a boat waiting Excellent. for us to take us for a spin around the bay. It just reinforces, doesn't it, this interaction between land and sea. Islands everywhere you look. We've now drawn up in front of Gatehold. Yeah, look at it. It's amazing seeing it from the sea, actually, because you get this incredible feeling of the connection of the sea and how important the sea must have been to these people. Yes. It just brings it really home to you how much the sea is a highway. The whole of the Irish Sea is sort of busy with boats all the time, yeah. connecting and um, meeting people and sharing culture. This is a central hub yeah. for Ireland, for Cornwall, for Brittany, for, you know, for the rest of West Wales. Yeah. So, you know, really, you're talking about a kind of you know, ancient motorway, really. Excellent. One of our key archaeological aims is to establish a link between the island and the fort. We've got promising signs of Iron Age buildings on both sites, but have we got proof of a connection? Phil, yesterday you said this was the trench where we'd got evidence of Iron Age settlement. Are you still happy with that? I am absolutely over the moon about that, Tony, because <laughs> I was right. Yeah. Um, except in that where I thought the house was has moved. <laughs> If you remember yesterday, I told you I thought that was going to be a central hearth. Yeah. It is not a central hearth. What we think now is that it is a, is a, a four-sided stone box, of which we've only got one stone. And this thing would have been possibly lined with clay and filled up with water. They're very, very common on Iron Age sites. I mean, some people use them for cooking, some people think they were used for saunas, some people also think you can use them for brewing, which is right up my street. <laughs> it's a lovely little domestic image, isn't it, that people were sitting around here eating their seafood, drinking their beer and uh, having a sauna, although presumably not all at the same time. <laughs> no, absolutely. But unlike us having our fish stew on the beach last night when we got rained upon, these people had a roundhouse. You have established that this is a roundhouse? Absolutely, because we've actually got the foundation trench of the roundhouse. And you can see where that pin in there with number yeah. 16 on it, that is the entrance. And if you look down there, the doorway is pointing directly at the entrance to the fort. And once you've got this bit in your mind, you can actually trace it coming round here on the geophysics and you can follow it round. It gets a bit fuzzy in here, but you can see it coming round here. And it gives you a roundhouse of about eight or nine metres, which is a classic size for an Iron Age roundhouse. So we need to prove the existence of an Iron Age roundhouse on the island before the end of the day. But the frequent torrential downpours are adding pressure to our ever-tightening schedule. The bad weather hasn't deterred Cassie, who's still excavating the area outside the entrance to the mainland fort. Cassie, I thought we were meant to have a road here. That looks like bedrock. Ah, well, it is bedrock. You're dead, dead straight on this. But if you look up here, we've got some slightly more rounded stones on the top. And, you know, it's just generally more warm, whereas down that end, it's far more angular. It's where the foot traffic's been on the bedrock. They're using the bedrock as their metal surface, effectively. I must admit, Cassie, it, it does look very much like a footpath. It is very much worn. I'll buy that, you know. Excellent. 
Two and a half thousand years ago, Cass's path, cut into the bedrock, would have led past a series of stone-faced banks, each topped off by a fence of woven hazel to a pair of high wooden gates. Nestled inside the fort would be at least half a dozen roundhouses. Quite a substantial and important settlement. And now for my final leap of faith. The last visit to Gatehome. We've got to get everything off the island as quickly as possible. And we just don't know whether we're going to get all the archaeology done in time, particularly as the weather forecast isn't all that great. But I quite frankly, I'm a little less worried about that than I am about getting to the other side in one piece. <sighs> You'd think it would get easier, wouldn't you? We're still trying to date the buildings on this intriguing isle. Was Gatehome once a sacred place? And can we prove a connection with the mainland settlement? We need some answers fast. Let's hope Matt's roundhouse is Iron Age. Matt, is this trench all wrapped up now? Pretty much, yeah. We've nearly finished the recording, that's it. Last time we were here, you'd only got this, this top bit, hadn't you? Yeah, we extended out this way because we thought we might have the doorway. So we took it another, what, nearly a metre. You can see the curve of the wall coming round here, but there's no doorway. So whatever it is, it is circular? It is definitely circular, yeah. Francis, you put this trench in because you wanted to try and establish whether or not we'd got an Iron Age roundhouse. What can we say? Well, it's certainly a roundhouse, Tony. Uh, quite a substantial one with large turf-built walls. Um, as for the dating, um, we don't have a lot of dating, but what we've got, I think, supports Iron Age. We've, yesterday, we found part of, a, of, a, of an Iron Age uh, quern or, or corn grinding stone, and that's the sort of thing you'd expect to find inside an Iron Age house. If it is an Iron Age roundhouse, yeah. and you seem pretty convinced it is, then how do you think it relates to our Iron Age settlement over there? Well, I think the people who were living here, Tony, were probably first or second cousins of the folk living over there. We've solved one part of the puzzle. During the Iron Age, the island and the fort were both occupied. But what about those cell-like structures we originally thought might be for early monks? Rakshar's now sure that was wrong. We certainly know that this building here is definitely Roman, but you'll never guess what we found this morning. Go. We found an earlier building in this trench. There's two post holes down there for timbers, and in one of them, we found this bit of pottery. Dating evidence, wow. It's very light and very gritty. Yes, and it's got large lumps of stuff in it, inclusions in, in it. Uh, I'm in little doubt, Tony, that that is actually Bronze Age. This is the evidence that there were people here 3,000 years ago. This is a big surprise. No monk cells, but proof that people were living here far earlier than we expected. Hundreds, if not thousands, of years before the Iron Age. So perhaps Gateholm was a sacred isle after all. Only not Christian, but pagan. Among the 50 or so finds this dig has thrown up, the bead found in Matt's trench on Gatehome is the most intriguing. So what did you get from the island? We've got a really fantastic thing here. Yeah, this is it's a little amber bead. It probably you know, it looks a little irregular, um, which is in some ways one of the nicest objects and, and perhaps most mysterious. Amber's not a local material. It's found originally in the Baltic. To have a amber turning up on an island where we really wouldn't expect it. This actually it might only be a small thing, but it's actually really exciting, an amber bead that's travelled for miles and miles and miles. Prized by Roman emperors, amber is associated with the worship of the sun and was believed to have magical properties. And like the bronze stag and the stone phallus, our amber bead could have been a ritual offering to the gods. So we clearly have sacred objects, but nothing Christian. Francis, when we first came here, you showed me this air picture, which apparently was of an early Christian monastic settlement. And we appear to have a little roadway here and lots of little monk cells. Well, 
It's disappeared, isn't it? We've just judged far too much off that aerial photograph. We've said, oh, buildings on a bit of rock sticking out into the sea got to be monks. No, we're completely wrong. So what have we got here? Well, what we've got, Tony, is a substantial settlement. It runs right the length of the island, from over there to right down to the headland over there. There have been hundreds of people living here, and it was well laid out and well organised as you've got that street there. I mean, this is a proper little settlement. So we now know that Gate Home wasn't always an island, but was once a rocky promontory, a busy settlement for possibly thousands of years. In the Bronze Age, perhaps 4,000 years ago, there were half a dozen farms. By the time of the Iron Age, Francis believes there would have been 12 or more roundhouses. And finally, by Roman times, the island would have been covered with many more buildings. Well, like all the best sleuths, we've managed to solve the mystery at the end of the story. So shall we get off this island quickly before the rain starts to get oh idea. God, aren't you staying to back, Phil? Uh, what, the trench? No, I'm, we'll leave that to you. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> Francis, when we came here, we wanted to try and solve the riddle of why such a complex settlement was built in such an out-of-the-way place. Do you think we've done that? I think we have, Tony. I think the basic answer is that this was not an out-of-the-way place. This was a densely populated landscape on the edge of one of the busiest seaways on the western approaches to the British Isles. What about the sacredness of this place? Um, we scotched the idea that there was an early Christian monastery over there. Does that mean it was an ordinary, prosaic settlement? What about that, that phallus and that bronze stag? I mean, they are ritual, they are religious objects. And, and, and it's location. I mean, it's a magical location. It, it protrudes, you know, out into the sea. It, it's mysterious. And even today, whether or not we think it's a sacred site, certainly a very special place, isn't it? Thank you.